Greetings, friends and brethren. This is Dr. Bob Teal for the Continuing Church of God. Today I want to talk about uh, days of blood and bread and not having tolerance for sin. There's a time in the Bible called the days of unleavened bread. Should Christians keep them? Does something learn about them with any meaning or applicability? And what's it got to do with sin? Should we just keep them haphazardly or should we be diligent about keeping them? Well, let's go back to the Old Testament. We're going to read a couple of passages here uh, about this. From Leviticus chapter 23, starting in verse 5, we le read about something. It says, On the fourteenth day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. So, uh, at, right after sunset, on the fourteenth of the month of uh, Nisan Abib, that's the first month of the uh, biblical year, Passover is to be kept. And on the fifteenth day of the same month, it's a feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So starting the next evening at sunset is a particular time of holy days. As, as there are seven days of unleavened bread, the first day is a holy convocation, and as, as is the seventh day, which means those are kept like a Sabbath. Go to church, you don't do secular work, school work, that kind of stuff. And there's actually a lot of Christian ramifications of this. Uh, perhaps I should mention that a lot of people don't understand that the Days of Living Bread uh, are mentioned in different places in the uh, New Testament, but in different ways. Uh, for example, in John uh, 19, verse 31, and I'm going to read this from the, uh, the New King... No, no I'm not going to read the New King. I'm going to read from the Dewey Rames, the Catholic translation. Then the Jews, because it was the Parascivi, that means the preparation, that the bodies might not remain on, on the cross or stake that Sabbath day. For that was a great Sabbath day. Besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, they might be taken away. Uh, let me give you a more modern language from the message. Then Jesus, 16, verse 31, Then the Jews, since it was a Sabbath day of preparation, so that the bodies wouldn't stay on the crosses on the Sabbath, it was a high holy day, that year. Petitioned Pilate that the legs be broken and the bodies taken down. Then in verse 42 the message says, so because it was Sabbath preparation for the Jews and the tomb was convenient, they placed Jesus in it. Now because of the term Sabbath, a lot of people, particularly on the Protestant side, have concluded this is a reference to Friday night. But actually, if you that's not what this is referring to. Um, even uh, various uh, Protestant scholars have realized that uh, Jesus was actually killed on a Wednesday and not on a Friday. But notice that according to the scripture here, Jesus was put in the tomb before the start of a great Sabbath, a high day, a holy day. What day was this? Well, I went to look at some Protestant and some Catholic uh, commentaries and from the uh, Jameson Fawcett in Brown commentary, it says that the bodies not, should not remain overnight against the Mosaic law on the Sabbath day. For that Sabbath was a high day or great day, the first day of unleavened bread. And as concurring with an ordinary Sabbath, the most solemn season of the ecclesiastical year. So we have a Protestant source saying, well, actually, this is the first day of unleavened bread, which is a Sabbath, by the way. And if you don't keep the holy days understand that they are kept as Sabbaths. It tells us that in Leviticus 23. I didn't read all of those passages, but that's part of it. And so a lot of people get confused because they don't keep the days of leavened bread. And you say, well, what do the Catholics say about this? Well, I, here's something from the Hadic Catholic Bible Commentary. And verse 31, the Jews, because it was the preparation that the bodies might not remain across the Sabbath, for that was a great Sabbath day the first and great day of the Feast of Azims. That's A-Z-Y-M-S. And that word actually means unleavened. So yes, both Catholic scholars and Protestant scholars realize that Jesus was to be buried just before the days of unleavened bread. And then later, of course, Jesus was uh, resurrected. And when Jesus was resurrected, by the way, it was during the days of unleavened bread. You know, if you figure Jesus was uh, grave three days and three nights, like the Bible says, and they put him in the 
grave just before the Days of Eleven Bread started. He was resurrected during that time. I'm going to go back to the uh, Old Testament again, this time to Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 15. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses, for whoever eats leavened bread from the first day to the seventh day, that person shall be cut off in Israel. Now the first day, by the way, the removal was actually done on the Passover day, which was a day you were allowed to work. On the first day there should be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there should be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work should be done on them, but that which everyone must eat. Only that may be prepared by you. So this is again saying, basically, that you keep the first day of unleavened bread like a Sabbath. Verse 17. So you shall observe the Feast of Leavened Bread. For on this same day I brought your armories out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations an everlasting ordinance. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread. Until the twenty-first uh, day of the month at evening. Seven days shall no leaven be found in your houses. For no leaven to be found in your houses for seven days, they ha it has to be removed prior to the start of the fifteenth. If you count from the fifteenth uh, to the twenty-first and you add each of these up, you get seven days. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats what is leavened, that same person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Whether it's a stranger or a native in the land, you shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. We'll get to what leaven symbolizes, but before we do so, consider and look, it's, it's really important to say, well, this is only for the Hebrews, children of Israel. But God made it very clear it was important they were not supposed to have any leaven during the days of leavened bread. Uh, the, both the passages I read from the Old Testament as well as 1 Corinthians from the New Testament, which I haven't read yet, uh, ties it in unleavened bread to Passover. As a matter of fact, while most professing Christians are aware that 1 Corinthians 5, 7 teaches that indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us, they don't observe the verse that follows. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, nor the, un nor the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Actually, most professing Christians don't seem to know they're supposed to be keeping any biblical feast. Now, they think they've got their reasons, though, but I think they're in error. I think we can prove that biblically. As a matter of fact, we do have a book, Should You Keep God's Holy Days or Demonic Holidays? This is available at the ccog.org website. Go into the literature tab under books and booklets and you'll find it. And it goes into scriptures as well as historical documentation or citations that show you that early Christians did believe they were supposed to keep biblical days such as the Days of Eleven Bread. Now maybe I should quote the entire portion of 1 Corinthians 5.7. It says... Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. You're supposed to purge out the old leaven, which we physically do by deleavening our houses, since you are truly unleavened, for indeed Christ our Passover sacrificed for you. Now, notice clearly that Gentile Christ Christians must be observing the days of unleavened bread, because that's who lived in Corinth. I, my wife and I have been to Corinth. It's in Greece. And be, Paul said to them, they're unleavened. So they would have been keeping the days of unleavened bread. The problem with the Corinthians is they were not spiritually unleavened. That's why he told them that they need to be unleavened with the unleavened bread of sincerity of truth. And now, do you believe this or not? Now, in Romans 3.25, you don't have to go there, Paul wrote, in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. So does that mean we're supposed to continue in sin? Jesus was our Passover sacrifice. Well, of course not. A few verses later, Paul wrote in Romans 3, verse 31, on the contrary, we established the law. Well, most seem to understand that Passover pictures a remembrance of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. Many don't understand that we're not supposed to continue in sin, or at least they seem like they don't understand. Why? One of the reasons is because they don't keep God's holy days. 
Now, as far as some spiritual ramifications of leaven, I want to go back to Exodus, this time Exodus 23, start in verse 14. Three times you shall keep a feast to me in a year. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty. Notice that at an appointed time. This is an annual time. A lot of people think they can decide what time they, could, they should, uh, what day they should keep the Sabbath or this kind of stuff. And God says he's got a time appointed. Well, the weekly Sabbath, he's got that as well. Some people think they should have a Passover meal or some version of it every day, every week, or every quarter, every month, whatever it is. But this is an annual event. Okay? And let's go to Second Chronicles chapter 30, verse 21. I'm just going to read one verse there, if you don't want to get to it. Second Chronicles 30, verse 21 says, So the children of Israel, who were present at Jerusalem, kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with great gladness, and the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing to the Lord, accompanied by loud instruments. They were not unhappy that they were keeping this day. Now you might want to go to Ezra, Ezra chapter 6. And read, I'm going to read verse 22. It says, Ezra 6, verse 22. And they kept the Feast of Eleven Bread seven days with joy. Did not consider the Holy Days to be some kind of a burden that should be taken away. Which is one of the foolish arguments people have. People, true Christians, have, always, have long kept the Biblical Holy Days. For the Lord made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them to strengthen their hands in the work of of the house of God, the God of Israel. They kept this day with joy, and it says the Lord made them joyful for keeping the days of 11, the seven days of eleven bread. It was not some improper burden. And joy, by the way, if you're Christian or you hope to be one, is one of the fruits of the Spirit, according to Galatians five verse twenty-two. Keeping the days of eleven bread should be joyous. Now, what about leaven? and unleavened bread and things like this. Well, in the world, sin and hypocrisy, they're prevalent. Likewise, in the world, leaven's all around. Not only is it in baked goods, it's many other products. Leaven spreads, and most items it becomes part of, they'll crumble. In the Bible, leaven normally pictures malice, wickedness, and hypocrisy, while unleavened bread pictures sincerity and truth. Now, the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 16, verse 3 says, No leaven shall be seen among you. Whereas the New Testament states, 1 John 1, 7, His Son cleanses us from all sin. And in 1 John 3, 4, sin is lawlessness. Or as it says in the Old King James, the transgression of the law. Jesus pointed out that leaven pictures the teachings of the Pharisees, who he called hypocrites. They claim to be God's leaders and teachers his way, but often were teaching traditions of men that Jesus con condemned them for. Uh, regarding part of that, I want to hold up another book we do have. Hope of Salvation, How the Continuing, jo Continuing Church of God uh, Differs from Protestantism. A lot of people think, oh, their, their teachers are all just fine. Well, that's what people thought about the Pharisees. Again, this book and the other ones are available at the ccog.org website. Let's go to Luke chapter 12. I'll read a couple of uh, verses here regarding uh, Levin and the Pharisees. Luke 12, starting in verse 1. In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There's nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. According to Strong's exhaustive concordance, the Greek word that Jesus used 
It was translated hypocrite means an actor under an assumed role. The Pharisees were false religious teachers who pretended to keep God's law but really didn't do it. They were actually bearing false witness and they endorsed false traditions. While some Protestants have indicated, I'm trying to find a book here, they talk, that the Ten Commandments are done away and that Jesus condemned the Pharisees for keeping the Ten Commandments. Actually, Jesus condemned the Pharisees for reasoning around the Ten Commandments, which is what a lot of people do uh, in the Greco-Roman Protestant world. Oh, by the way, this is another booklet uh, about the Ten Commandments, also available at the ccog.org website. Do you have any false traditions that you follow? False traditions from other religions or even your own excuses as to why you can't change and become the leaven in certain areas? Well, you need to examine yourself. Leaven is a symbol of false doctrine and hypocrisy that Jesus warned against. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16. Sometimes when Jesus made statements that were allegorical, if you will, because the disciples thought they were uh, literal, and this is one of those times, Matthew 16, starting verse 6, Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then they reasoned among themselves, It's because we have taken no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Oh, you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you brought no bread? Don't you understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Nor the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it you don't understand that I did not speak concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Then they understood he didn't tell them to beware of the leaven of the bread, but the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And as far as some doctrines that we're warning people about, uh, various, some of them are mentioned, for example, in this, this, this book that uh, we're, we're in the process of putting out. And, but uh, a draft of it is available at the ccog.org website. Now I want to go to Matthew 23. I'm going to start in verse 13. I'm going to read this from one from the Young's Literal Translation. Most of the time I read from the New King James. This is Young's Literal. Matthew 23, starting in verse 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut up the rain of the heavens before men, for you do not go in, nor those going in do you suffer to enter. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you eat up the houses of widows and for a pretense make long prayers. Because of this, you shall receive a more abundant judgment. This reminds me of what happens with uh, people giving donations for purgatory, to get people out of purgatory. Anyway, verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you go around the sea in dry land and make one proselyte. Whenever it happens, you make um, a son of a Gehenna twofold more than yourselves. Now, it's unrepentant sinners that are going to experience a second death with Gehenna fire. Leaven, in those passages, is being used by Jesus to represent the seriousness of of sin. Jesus further described the Pharisees by saying in Matthew 23 verse 28, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. And again, Protestant preachers in general like to say that the Pharisees were condemned for being legalists keeping the law. No, they were condemned because they didn't properly keep the law. They reasoned around it, which again is a problem in uh, the Greco-Roman Protestant world. Jesus tied leaven with the Pharisees' sinful teachings in Matthew 16, 12, false religion and being hypocrites, etc. He also tied it in with pride. For example, we'll go to Mark, Mark chapter 7. And now let's just pick it up in verse 14. When he called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There's nothing that enters a man from outside that, which can defile him, but the things which come out of him. Those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, Are you also without understanding? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from the outside cannot defile him? 
because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying the foods that they're eating. Verse 20, And he said to them, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile a man. Well, pride puffs up. And the Apostle Paul specifically used the expression puffed up with pride in 1 Timothy 3, verse 6, when he warned about a novice becoming an ordained church leader. He also warned that instead of mourning or repenting, the Corinthian church was wrongly puffed up in 1 Corinthians 5, 2. Well, leaven puffs bread up. Pride puffs people up. Leaven makes bread look bigger than it would be otherwise. A lot of people want people to think they're bigger than they are. It's the pride of many that keep a lot of people from keeping God's holy days. Uh, they themselves, instead of the church of God, uh, are become judges of the holy days. I'd like to read from... Uh, See, which one should I do? I'm going to read from the New King James Version of the Bible, uh, where I slightly modified it. Starting verse 16 of Colossians. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you to go to Colossians. Colossians 2. Therefore, let no, one, no man judge you in eating and drinking or respect of a festival or the observance of a new moon of a, or a Sabbath. Now, some Protestants make it sound like, well, that means that these are done away. No. Since those things are a shadow of things to come. But the body of Christ. Now, translators throw in the word, the body is of Christ. But no, this is saying that those who judge how it should be kept are, is the church of God, the body of Christ. But instead, people have been cheated out of their reward by relying on mistranslations and misinterpretations of this. And that's even more about it, the next verse. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding those things which you have not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And you say, well, you don't do worship of angels. Well, actually, the Apostle Paul referred to phony holidays, pagan holidays, as those of the demons. And here's some symbols associated with demonic holidays. Well, demons are fallen angels. And uh, people are basically doing angel worship when they don't do God's holy days, but switch to many of the world's holidays. Anyway, vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind, not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with increases from God. Now, because of mistreat teachings, most people don't understand what the early Christian church taught. We've got a documented booklet, The Continuing History of the Church of God, also available at the ccog.org website. It goes in more details about what the early church taught. Now, some people don't know much about leaven or leavening, leavening agents, but basically, the types of leavening agents that are used these days are like active dry yeast, ammonium uh, car carbonate, ammonium bicarbonate, baker's ammonia, uh, baker's yeast, baking powder, baking soda, bicarbonate soda, Dipotassium carbonate, potassium bicarbonate, potassium carbonate, sodium bicarbonate, also known as saleratus, sourdough yeast starter, and monocalcium phosphates. Now, some things are not yeast, uh, autolyzed yeast, uh, I mean, they're not leavening agents, brewer's yeast, um, uh, yeast extract, truly yeast, uh, some of those kind of things are, are not. We have a list of all this stuff at the cogwriter.com website in the article on Should Christians Keep the Days of Eleven Bread, which is where most of my notes for today are coming from. Anyway, physically, leavening agents puff up a grain and make them look larger than they or bigger than they are. And people also want to look better than they are, more influential than they really are. You don't have to go there, but Micah 6 verse 8 says what God really wants. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Satan's problem was he refused to walk humbly. He was anointed cherub, uh, Ezekiel 28, 14. 
He had it all, but his pride got in the way. Ezekiel 28:17. Humans often let their pride get in the way, and pride puffs people up. Most people will not do what God wants them to do, as their pride and human influence, human reason, excuse me, human reasoning, influenced by Satan, gets in the way. Go to Proverbs 16. Starting in verse 18, Proverbs 16. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lonely than to divide the spoil with the proud. He who heeds the word wisely will find good. And whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. Can you, do you really trust God and not yourself? Can you humble yourself and really change your life, correct your faults? Well, you can with Jesus' help as it says in Philippians 4.13. Obadiah 3 says, The pride of your heart has deceived you. Don't be one who's allowing the pride of their heart to deceive them. In Proverbs 29, it says, 23, it says, A man's pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. Proverbs 18.12 says, Before destruction, the man, heart of a man is haughty. Before honor is humility. In Proverbs 15.33, it says, Fear of the Lord is instruction of wisdom, of wisdom, and before honor is humility. God wants you to forsake pride, accepts His teaching, be humble. Then He'll grant honor. No, I know it's not always easy. Many don't have the faith to truly humble themselves. And as a matter of fact, Jesus talked about end time, the end times in Luke 18, verse 8, said, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith in the earth? By the way, we do have a booklet on faith. Okay, Why would Jesus have to say that if all Christians are just fine? Many claim to believe in Jesus, but they're unwilling to truly humble themselves before God. And such humility takes faith. I mentioned before in Exodus 12, it says, On the first day you should remove leaven from your houses. Now those who attempt to obey God, they'll follow, they follow this. They remove all leavened breads, crackers, etc. from their houses. They clean out their toasters and otherwise remove physical leaven from their lives just prior to the start of the day's leavened bread each year. Most people don't have the humility to do this. And many seem to let pride get in the way of removing their own sins. We're always supposed to be examining ourselves. Anyway, so that's the physical removal of leaven requires uh, work. And the term for day in Exodus 12, 15 is M-I-Y-O-Y-M, which is different from the normal term for day, which is Hebrew word, which is U W B A Y O W M in Exodus twelve sixteen, and I want to mention that because Strong's concordance uses the same number for both, but this is two different words. This suggests that the removal should be start done before the start of the first day, which is what we do. This is also consistent with other statements in the Book of Exodus that seven days no unleavened bread should be found in your houses, and un and unleavened bread should be eaten seven days, and low leavened bread should be among you in our 11th senior quarters, Exodus 13, 7. And the only way for that to be is if you pull it all out. I'm going to read something from the old uh, Worldwide Church of God, the Good News Magazine, from uh, March of 1981, their questions and answers. The question is just what's leaven, which foods would be avoided during the days of leavened bread? It says, God uses leaven to typify sin. Sin puffs up as physical leaven puffs up. Unleavened bread is a type of an unleavened life. To understand exactly what's included in leaven, to avoid during the days of leavened bread, let's see the Hebrew words translated leaven in the Old Testament. One is mechamez, it refers to leavening agents. That would be like things that puff up, like yeast, bicarbonate soda, baking soda, baking powder, and such things. There's another word called leaven in Hebrew, it's called seod. It means sourdough. Okay? Uh, these leavening agents cause food to become what they call shamets, C-H-A-M-E-T-Z. And the word means that which is leavened. 
It's also translated as leavened, leavened bread in other places. Leavened bread is the type of bread most of us tend to eat most of the time, those of us who eat bread. Anyway, it refers to all foods that has leaven, like bread, cake, some crackers, certain cookies, some prepared cereals and pies. A few candies and other foods also use leavening agents. If you're ever in doubt, check the ingredients on the wrapper. Instead of eating, eating, eating leavened bread, we have the positive command to eat unleavened bread. We may also eat unleavened pies and cereals together with all the meats, fruits, drinks, and vegetables we normally consume. It says many store, most stores carry varieties of unleavened bread and check the ingredients. And they talked about that yeast extracts aren't yeast because it's totally dead. It doesn't make things rise. Occasionally a question comes up about beer or fermented drinks. There's nothing in the scripture about uh, getting rid of beverages. And as a matter of fact, uh, some wine, to make wine, they, uh, one time I tried to make wine for my parents a long, long, long time ago. And I'm not a wine drinker. I don't really care much for wine. I had to use, I used uh, leaven to do it, to make it. Uh, anyway, uh, and because they used wine at Passover, they were uh, not necessarily, they weren't getting rid of all the wine they had. And then he, they've commented here, naturally fermented wine was consumed by the Israelites at God's feast. And if, so if fermented beverages were prohibited, it would have said something about it, but it doesn't do that. Now, if somehow time during the feast you find some leavened products that you miss when you're de leavening, uh, get it off your property immediately. We've had this happen a few times. Sometimes, uh, uh, I may have told you this story before, but one of the strangest ones was one time uh, Joyce and I done a fantastic job, I thought, of de leavening the house. Just really details, went through everything, just in incredible detail. And then it's about, I don't know, about a half hour before sunset, we get a, a box that was from her mother. And we open the box, and it's full of cookies. And I was like, how are we going to get rid of this? Uh, so um, I took it and I ran over to a, a trash bin, which is a couple of blocks, several blocks away, and put it in there. And so we got rid of it uh, just before the days of lemon bread. Um, we didn't tell our mother-in-law that's why we did it. Um, she asked how, how the cookies were. And actually, I did see a, an ant in the box, maybe a couple of ants in the box that she'd sent. So we said that um, there were ants in it, so we didn't eat them. But... Uh, because she wasn't interested to hear about the days of loving bread. Anyway, get, to conclude with what the Good News magazine says, God intended the days of loving bread to be a type to remind us that we are to be unleavened, unleavening our lives spiritually by putting out the spiritual leaven of sin, not for seven days only, but through our entire lives. Therefore, let's keep the feast, not of the old leaven with malice and wickedness, but of the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Anyway, unleavened bread is made without leavening agents. There's various types of uh, flat bread, including corn tortillas, which are a type of unleavened bread. Unleavened bread does not have to be made out of wheat, okay? And also, by the way, it does not have to be blessed by a Jewish rabbi or follow Jewish kosher rules that, that are outside of Scripture. And if you've got dietary concerns, only consume a very small amount if you can't have it. Now, as Christians, we know we're supposed to examine ourselves before Passover, uh, so let's let's re go to First Corinthians eleven. Starting verse twenty seven. Therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself so we may eat the bread and drink the cup. He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment of himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. So obviously, uh, though our examination isn't only limited to time of Passover, you don't have to go there. In 2 Corinthians 13.5, Paul wrote, Examine yourselves as whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you know yourselves that Christ is in you unless you're disqualified? During the days of leavened bread, as we avoid the consumption of leaven and we eat unleavened bread, we should continue to examine ourselves. And Jesus said in John 7, 27, Don't judge according to appearance, 
but judge with righteous judgment. And leavening in bread makes it appear different than the substance truly is. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians 10. Starting verse 7. Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. And even if I should boast somewhere more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification and not for your destruction, I shall not be ashamed. Now some people think that any minister who uses any ecclesiastical authority, it's for your destruction. You need to avoid that. But no proper ministers, what they're doing is for your edification. Verse 9, Lest I seem to terrify you by letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Apparently, Paul understood that people didn't think he was that good of a speaker. And the message is more important than being entertained, however. Verse 11, Let such person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when we are absent, we also be indeed when we are present. For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. A lot of people compare themselves against others in ways are not appropriate. We need to use God's standards and not our lowered ones. We examine and judge ourselves. And the days of eleven bread are a good time to do that. Let's Go, okay, we'll go to Romans 9. Read a few verses here. Verse 19. You will say to me then, Why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? The thing, say to him, informed it. Why have you made me like this? People will argue, why well, don't have to keep days on bread? But God's, God's rules make sense. We may not understand all of them, all of the reasons, and we don't understand all of them because God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts and God's ways are higher than our ways. But we need to obey God. And one of the things God's people have done is keep the days of living bread, and this includes Christians. Now, the... Uh, Old uh, Worldwide Church of God uh, put something else out about this. This is uh, in the Good News Magazine of March 1984. An important reminder how leaven pictures sin. And it says, Living in sin is easy. Being righteous is hard. Um, I'm going to comment that it only appears that living in sin is easy, because sin has its consequences. You know, as it says in Numbers 32, verse 23, be sure your sin will find you out. Anyway, getting back to the article, because of its soft texture, leavened bread is easier to eat than leavened, unleavened bread. Likewise, going the way of sin is easier than living righteously. Obeying God is difficult even for Christians, because you still have a carnal nature that wants to sin. Sin exalts the self. Righteousness builds humility. Leaven puffs bread up, the same is true of sin. It puffs up the sinner. His desire is to exalt himself rather than allow God to rule him. You, when you choose to live God's righteous way of life, you abase selfish desires. God is showing through the analogy of leaven that he wants us to escape from the clutches of sin and lead righteous lives. Since pleasures are temporary, the benefits of righteousness endure. Leavened bread left out soon becomes hard and moldy. Unleavened bread lasts much longer. Spiritually, the pleasures of sin soon pass away. The end result is eternal death. By the way, they've got scriptures quoted, cited for this, but I'm, which I'm not reading. Again, it's in the article at cogwriter.com. Righteousness, in contrast, brings temporal and eternal blessings, both. Sin spreads easily. Righteousness is built slowly. It doesn't take long for leaven to spread throughout an entire loaf of bread. Say it, that's the way sin is. It spreads rapidly. Whereas building character takes a lifetime. Sin is based on deceit. Truth is based is the basis for righteousness. 
What you see is not what you get with a loaf of leavened bread. Air pockets give the impression there's more of the loaf than there really is. Sin also appears to be something it isn't. Deceiving a sinner think he's getting something worthwhile while he's only earning the death penalty. With righteousness, there's no deceit, only truth. Sin is more prevalent than righteousness. Most people prefer leavened bread because they find the taste more desirable. Is it really better? Not necessarily, just more common. People are accustomed to it. Spiritually, the same is true. Most people prefer to live in sin, but you must reject sin and choose to live a righteous life. And, of course, it's okay to eat bread with leaven throughout the year. I mean, the Bible has that in. matter of fact, um, a sin offering, uh, or excuse me, an offering during the day of Pentecost involved leavened bread, so God is not against it. Anyway, sin builds a false image. Righteousness builds true character. Leavened bread gives a false impression. So does a sinner. They might, sinners may appear impressive on the outside, but... At this on appearance. We need to recognize sin. Many can't. Why? Because most people overlook God's simple definition of sin. And they here they're quoting uh, the old King James, 1 John 3, verse 4. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. Discerning sin is a matter of applying God's law and for his Ten Commandments. We should examine ourselves. We're supposed to resist sin. Throughout the Bible, we see the number seven used for completion. In relationship to the days of leavened bread, seven pictures the complete elimination of sin. We're supposed to repent of sin if we have it. We're supposed to confess our sins. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And we'll do that. Are you going to overcome all sins all at once? Well, absolutely not. Some sins are so deeply and habitually rooted, it may take years or decades to overcome. But don't use that as an excuse to continue in sin. Ask yourself, are you sinning like you once did? Does this sin have as much control as it once did? If the answer is no, you're growing. You're making progress. The world is in misery because of sin. Yet humanity rejects the very festival, the days of bread, that pictures a process that would lead the world out of sin. And hopefully you're keeping them, and you're going to keep them diligently. If you do work at ridding your life of sin, you'll be greatly blessed. It says in Proverbs 12, 28, In the way of righteousness is life, and it's, in his pathway there's no death. God is faithful. I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 10, 12 to 13. And this somewhat has to do with pride amongst other things. First Corinthians twelve excuse me, first Corinthians ten, verse twelve. Therefore let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. Okay, so don't let pride get in the way. But also don't excuse your sin. Verse thirteen. No temptation has overcome you, overtaken you, except that it is common to man. For God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation make a way escape, you may be able to bear it. You may have prayed and you may have fallen. You may have sinned and done the same sin multiple times. But you should be making progress. Don't use the excuse that you tried and you failed. It says in Zechariah 4, 6, you don't have to go there. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And I'm going to read from John 4, verses 16 to 17 from a faithful version. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that it may be with you throughout the age, even the spirit of truth, which the world cannot receive because it receives it not, nor knows it. But you know it because it dwells with you and shall be within you. I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. I mentioned before Philippians 4.13, but didn't quote it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, so don't give up. Now let's go to 1 John 1, verse 8. The days of 11 bread are an annual reminder. If people were perfect after baptism and Passover, perhaps God wouldn't have the days of 11 bread. But we're not perfect. 1 John 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you that, so that you may not sin. Emphasis of the days of love and bread, by the way, is to put sin out. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know we're in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself ought to walk just as he walked. Well, Jesus kept the Ten Commandments. Jesus kept the holy days. Since God knew we weren't going to be perfect, we are to keep the days of love and bread. Now it says in Romans 3.23, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And let's go to uh, Romans 6. For most people who start to keep the days of unleavened bread, at least in certain Western cultures, this is totally new. To not have leavened products for a week, it's, it's kind of unheard of. So things change. In the Christian life, things are supposed to change. Romans 6, starting in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. So we're after the Passover comes the days of leavened bread. We're not, it's to show us we're not supposed to continue in sin. How shall we who died in sin live any longer in it? And do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. And it's certainly new for people who never kept days of love and bread, and even for those who have kept it. I've, I don't know, 40 some years, I don't know, times. Uh, it was new to me, and even, even now, you know, I, I typically have uh, bread uh, most days for, for my lunch, and so I, I will change. Uh, and so it's, it's even new to me, even though I've done it for decades. Verse 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. We're supposed to be diligent about sin. For he who dies is freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, verse 11, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That doesn't mean being dead to sin, you're supposed to go out and sin. Verse 12, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts. Okay, we're not supposed to sin. Do not present your members' instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But present yourselves to God. So don't put yourself in a situation where you're going to sin, or probably going to sin. And your members and instruments of righteousness God, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. You say, Protestants have misunderstood that, by the way. Again, I held up a book that we have about how we differ from the, from the Protestants. The trap book here. We're not under the penalty of the law, but we're not supposed to sin. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Uh, go down to verse 20. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did, did you have then in the things which you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. We're not supposed to continue to sin. It leads to death. But now having set free from sin and having become slaves of God, to be slaves of God, we are to obey God. You would have the fruit 
to holiness and in the end everlasting life for the ways of sin is death and the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now we're not supposed to haphazardly keep the holy days, days of 11 bread. I'm going to read Proverbs 10 verse 4. He who has a slack hand becomes poor, but the hand of the diligent becomes rich. Of course, that has physical application. But it's also got a spiritual one. Let's go to 2 Timothy 2. Second Timothy 2, verse 15. The Apostle Paul wrote, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now I want to go to 1 Peter 5. Starting with verse 8. Consider the following. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, Steadfast in faith, knowing the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Be vigilant. Satan wants to devour you. Satan is real. Now you have a choice. I'm not going to read it, but in uh, Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 to 20, I'll read just the first part of it. it says, See, I've said before you today, life and death, life and good, good and evil. And you're supposed to choose life. You have a choice. And Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We're to live God's way of life, not the way of death. Let's go to John 6. John 6. I want to start reading verse 48, some words that Jesus also said. He says, I am the bread of life. Your father ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. And manna was unleavened, by the way. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, which one may eat of it and not die. For I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give shall give us my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Uh, manna was unleavened. And by the way, during the Passover service, it, uh, Jesus would have kept what some people call the Last Supper. And the Passover service, we need to continue in Church of God keep, we use unleavened bread. Generally speaking, though, leaven is all around and we tolerate. Sin is all around and we tolerate our own sins more than we should. We're supposed to leave an, uh, lead an unleavened life. I'd like to read something that the late uh, Pastor General of the Old Worldwide Church of God, Herbert W. Armstrong, uh, wrote. And this is under a subheading called Purpose of the Festival. This is from the Good News Magazine, March 1979. So Purpose of the Festival, a festival. Let's learn the full significance of this. Why did God ordain these feast days? What was his great purpose? This is turned down now to Exodus 13.3. Uh, Moses said to the people, Remember this day which you came out of Egypt. This was the 15th of Abib which is the first day of unleavened bread. Verse 6, Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and the seventh day shall be a feast unto the eternal. This is done because of what the eternal did. It's a memorial. It shall be a sign, miraculous proof of identity, unto thee upon thy hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes. Why? That the Lord's law may be put in thy mouth, and therefore shall keep this ordinance. And of, end of quoting the King James there. But he, Herbert Armstrong continues, O oh, beloved brethren, do you see the wonderful meaning? Do you grasp the true significance of it? Do you see God's purpose? The Passover pictures the death of Christ for the remission of sins that are past. The accepting of His blood does not forgive sins we shall commit. It doesn't give us a license to continue in sin. Therefore, when we accept it, our sins are forgiven only up to that time, our past sins. Of course, we can confess some other ones. But shall we stop there? Past sins are forgiven, but we're still flesh beings. We still shall suffer temptation. Sin has its, has its in its clutch. We become slaves to, to sin in its power. We are powerless to deliver ourselves from it. We become, we've been in bondage to sin. Let us understand the picture, the meaning. Now, to what degree? That's the end of what he wrote there. 
Should Christians put away sin? Completely. Matthew 5, 48, Jesus said, You shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Like sin, leaven puffs up. Seven is God's number for completion. Christians are to follow up Passover with seven days of unleavened bread. I'd like to go now to uh, something from uh, Jude. I want to read a couple different things from Jude. Verse 2's only got one chapter. And I'm going to read verse uh, 24. Jude wrote, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And I've already cited or mentioned Philippians 2.13 and 4.13, excuse me, about you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Jude's basically saying the same thing. If you will rely on God, He won't give up on you, even if you fall and stumble. Now Jude also warned in verse 4, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into licentiousness and denied the only Lord God and Lord Jesus Christ. Now, one of the reasons this is interesting, because in the next verse, he ties this in with deliverance from Egypt during the day of the leavened bread. He says, verse 5, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. As Paul wrote in Romans 3, verse 25, about the sacrifice of Jesus, God passed over the sins that were previously committed. And he may well afterwards destroy those who didn't believe. How do you know if you have a faith and believe? Well, by doing what God says. You know, James wrote in James 2, verse 19, You believe there's one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and they tremble. But you want to know a foolish man that faith without works is dead. And Paul wrote, not to go there, but Romans 2.13, For the hearers of the law, for not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Now I'm going to go to Hebrews 10. You might want to go there and read verses 26 and 27. For if we sin willfully after we've received knowledge of the truth, there remains no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment, fire, fiery indignation. Now that doesn't mean if you know you shouldn't do something, you end up doing it, uh, that there's no sacrifice for sins. But if you go out and say, okay, I committed, uh, let's say fornication, I'm going to intentionally go out and do this, uh, then you've got a pro problem with this. Anyway, the Old Testament teaches to purge out the old leaven in 1 Corinthians 5. From a physical standpoint, it's not easy to uh, obey these teachings. Physically, it's easier not to purge out or remove leaven from all our dwellings. Particularly if you've never done it before. If you've never done it before, you really need to look everywhere. You'd be surprised the place you might find crumbs or whatever. But spiritually, by not keeping the days of leaven bread, many fail to understand that they have to live the way Jesus taught. Many instead accept a false outward religion. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he, one of the things he commanded in the Old Testament was keeping the days of the leavened bread. Let's go to uh, Galatians chapter 5. There are many leaders Greco-Roman Protestant churches who have their own opinions on various things, mostly based on, many times based upon more on tradition than on what the early church taught, truly taught, and what the Bible truly teaches, despite various groups claiming sola scriptura. Apostle Paul warned, Galatians 5, starting verse 7, 
Who hindered you from obeying the truth? I've had people say, oh, the reason I'm not going to do the right thing is uh, such and such was a good Christian. She didn't, he or she didn't do these things. Or such and such is a great minister. He's so good, he can't be wrong. Who, Paul said, hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. If you're being called now, don't rely on false teachings and wrong examples. Verse 9, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Paul was warning Christians that they shouldn't allow a little compromise with the world, apparently including arguments from friends or acquaintances or perhaps even families, should affect him. Christians who, keep the un, who kept the unleavened, days of unleavened bread understood it then, and hopefully those doing it today as well. A little sin is not good. In Matthew 7, 21, Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Okay? Now, in the Greco-Roman Protestant world, you're going to have people who say, well, there's certain miracles, signs, and wonders. Uh, we've seen demons cast out. We have exorcists or whatever it is. Notice what Jesus says about that. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? People are walking by sight and not by faith on this. And Jesus is talking about people who claim to be Christians because they call Him Lord. In verse 23, And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Which is one of the reasons I've held up this book a few times, because many people do practice lawlessness even though they don't realize that they do it. And if they would keep God's holy days, this would also assist them, particularly the days of leavened bread, which pictures putting out sin. During the days of leavened bread, you're not eating leaven. So that's a reminder. Oh, I can't have that. It should be a reminder that you should be not having sin. You should be avoiding sin and putting sin out of your life. And in eating the, the unleavened bread, which I will do during the day of leavened bread, since I'm avoiding leavened bread, reminds me, oh, these are the days of leavened bread. And, you know, if I eat the leavened bread, that's right, it's the time to not just focus on eating a piece of bread, but being growing spiritually. Uh, as far as uh, the days of leavened bread, uh, we see it mentioned a few times in the New Testament. For example, Acts 12, 3, it says, now that was during the days of leavened bread. It doesn't say those days were, uh, were done away. And by the way, the book of Acts was written by Luke to a Greek by the name of Theophilus. And if Christians weren't keeping the days of leavened bread, he would have had to explain this. But he didn't have to explain it because Theophilus knew what it was. Why? Because Gentiles were keeping the days of leavened bread. Furthermore, in Acts 20, verse 6, Luke wrote, We sailed away from Philippi after the days of leavened bread. Even the Greek Orthodox saint and patriarch, John Chrysostom, realized this was proof that Paul kept the days of love and bread. Chrysostom wrote, and this is his homily 43 on the Acts of the Apostles, And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of love and bread, and came upon them to Troas in five days, where we abode seven days. So he quotes the scriptures, and Chrysostom writes, For it seems... To me, that he made a point of keeping the feast in the large, large cities. Yes, Paul was keeping the feast. Whether or not he made a point of keeping the large cities, maybe he did. But Paul was keeping the days of leavened bread. This is after Jesus was resurrected. These days were not done away. It was in Macedonia, uh, and that was ruled by the Romans. And these days were not limited, by the way, to keep him in Jerusalem, as some people have falsely claimed. At least two places in the New Testament, in Gentile areas, we see the days of the bread were kept. One's in uh, Corinthians, and then the other I just read here. If Christians weren't keeping the days of the bread, you'd think Luke or Paul would say so. Evan said Paul kept them. Now, as far as tradition goes, a lot of traditions people have, and they hope that they came from the true church. But the reality is, you've got people like the Apostle John who kept Passover, uh, we can, uh, and the Days of Eleven Bread. And 
Let me just read something that the Apostle John warned. This is in uh, 1 John 2. First John 2, starting verse uh, 18. Little children, this is the last hour, as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know it's the last hour. They went out from us. They claimed to be Christians. They claimed to be, claimed to be apostolic Christians, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. It's well known one of the earliest documented changes in the practice of the Apostle Paul was when others changed the date of Passover to Sunday. And those who did, most of them apparently did not keep the days of love and bread, and their spiritual descendants don't do that today. I've got a lot of pages I'm going through about uh, early Christians uh, keeping it, and I don't think I need to go through those today. I've done those kind of things before. Uh, let me just say one other thing that the old uh, uh, radio church of God taught. This is uh, April 1954. To observe Passover alone, and then fail to observe the seven days of leavened bread means, in symbolism, to accept Christ's blood, then to continue in sin. And again, the days of leavened bread come right after Passover. And it shows us, it shows us that, okay, our sins have been forgiven. We're not supposed to walk in sin anymore. And not only are we not supposed to walk in sin, we're to be diligent. We're to take steps to do a couple things. Again, not eat any leavened bread, so we have to not eat that. You have to be careful also, by the way. I remember one time I was uh, going out to lunch during the days of leavened bread, and I try not to go to restaurants on the days of leavened bread for various reasons because it's hard to avoid leaven. And so... You order a salad, you think that's safe, right? Well, they put croutons in the salad. And so that was uh, difficult, so I had to get around that. Um, so anyway, during the days of bread, we keep our eyes out for leaven. And we also keep our eyes out for sin, and our sin in our own life. Because it can come in places, ways you're not expecting. And we also eat unleavened bread. And by eating the unleavened bread, it reminds us to where to be humble. Uh, like like a flat a flat piece of a flat piece of bread because again uh, when when people have leaven with bread it's uh, in bread it, it puffs it it puffs it up the days of leavened bread help us more clearly realize that Satan and sin are all around us by conscientiously avoiding leaven which is a symbol of sin and hypocrisy during the day of leavened bread, while we're exposed to the world, and by eating unleavened bread every day, this helps us better grasp how we need to be careful in how we normally live our lives. Although the days of leavened bread are first mentioned in the Old Testament, it's in the New Testament that we learn more fully that today's leaven pictures false religion and sin. The New Testament shows a connection between Jesus' sacrifice and removal of sin from our lives. Leaven, according to Jesus, is a symbol of sin and hypocrisy, and we're not supposed to tolerate it. At risk of repeat, I want to reread something from the Apostle Paul from Galatians 5. Who hindered you? From obeying the gospel, from obeying the truth. This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. During days of leavened bread, the physical reminders of avoiding leaven and consuming leavened bread should help us more focus on removing sin from our lives. But notice, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little sin hurts everything. It's not like, oh, a little sin is okay. That's why I read this again. A little sin is not okay. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. According to the Apostle Paul. 
Now let's go back to something that Peter wrote. This is 2 Peter 5. I'm going to read a couple other verses than I did before. Uh, 1 Peter 5, starting verse 8. I'm going to... Uh, now I'm going, to, I'm going to reread that, and I'm going to go to 1 Peter 1, verse 5. Okay, let's go here. As a reminder, 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Peter wrote, Be sober, be vigilant. So, vigilant, you're looking out for stuff, looking out for sin during these days, looking out for leaven. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Now let's go to 2 Peter, this time, 2 Peter 1, we'll start in verse 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add your faith virtue, your virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance. And self-control is something we need to learn, including by avoiding leaven. Perseverance, to perseverance, so keep all seven days. Godliness. The godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, love. For if those things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. We're going to cleanse our houses from leaven. Symbolically showing that our lives spiritually have been cleansed from sin. Should we just be, you know, just so-so about this? Verse 10. Therefore, brethren, being even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Be vigilant and diligently keep the days of love and bread. Don't be puffed up. Don't rely on false arguments to keep you from being God of the Bible. Apostle Paul wrote that we're to keep this feast. It reminds us the little leaven leavens the whole lump. Avoid leaven, avoid sin. All of it. Don't tolerate sin. Remove it from your life. Remove leaven from your houses. Keep the days of love and bread. This is Dr. Bob Teal with the Continuing Church of God.